And then I took an art class over the summer and I decided to change my major and I wandered around the art department. I took painting classes, I took drawing classes, I took everything they had to offer and it was really sad because I didn't have any talent. <laughs> um, and then I fell in with a group of um, other artists that didn't really have talent. <laughs> And um, we started doing performance art, which if you know anything about the art history in the 70s, it was sort of coming, coming about. And I started making films with these people and we started doing a weekly performance. And then after that, I decided to take, take a photography class and I picked up a camera and I was like, oh my goodness, I've been taking art classes for two years, I had no talent. I finally figured out what I have some talent for. So this is my very first photo on my very first roll of film from my very first photography class. So I'm just going, and again, these were all shot in Youngstown, Ohio. So I just want to briefly kind of run through some work that I did. Um, in Youngstown, Ohio, at that point in time, was um, uh, you know going through um, a severe recession. It was a steel town. The steel mills were closing. People were moving away. Buildings were being torn down. This was an old train station that I wanted to photograph while it was being torn down. And all of these photos were parts of series. Like I'm shooting series of photos at the same time because I started making films first and I sort of viewed photography as a way to make films but without movement. So again, um, and these are just my friends. They're all people that I knew and we would spend a lot of time going out to thrift stores shopping and finding clothes and you know vintage clothes, clothes from the 20s, 30s, 40s. At that point in time you could buy a paper, get a big shopping bag full of clothes for a dollar. Like everything that you could stuff in there you could get for a dollar. It didn't matter what it was. Um, these are the artists <coughs> that I met that didn't have any talent as artists that started <laughs> doing performance art, making films together. Um, there's me. <laughs> And that's my first studio photo ever. Like I, you know, I had access to a photo studio there and I started shooting. Um, this series here, this is, this is a, uh, this, like I said, Youngstown was a steel town and in the late 70s the steel mills were starting to close, but they were still operating. And um, this was this girl that I met out in a club and I asked her if she wanted to pose for me and uh, so we decided to go to the Center Street Bridge which crossed the steel mill at 3 o'clock at the end of the shift and I just photographed her on the bridge as the mill workers got off work and she was like interacting with them and I just kept on shooting and they sort of like totally ignored me because she looked a lot better. <laughs> and uh, I was say you got her number. What's that? You got her number. So uh, yeah. So I shot a whole roll of film. I shot um, a roll of 36, and many years later, I printed the entire roll of film because I was asked to be in a show that had 36 as the number of pieces you needed to do for some reason. I can't remember exactly why, but um, so, anyways, that was all shot during my first photo class. This was my second photo class. I took a color photography class. I learned how to develop color prints by heating chemicals on a hot plate until they got to 90 degrees, and then you poured them into a drum and you rolled it back and forth. So these are my early color photos. And again, it was pretty much the same thing. I was living in a town that was in decay. There were a lot of buildings that looked like they were like war-torn Germany. Um, I mean, these were the type of locations that I sought out. And again, all I did was I worked with my friends. A train that was going nowhere. Another train station. Take your clothes off and crawl in the cage. <laughs> <laughs> and then I left Ohio. So I left Ohio in 1979, <coughs> it took a month to drive across country, I drove into California in, on uh, January 27th, 1980, I lived here a year, I, I opened up a bank account, 
I got a driver's license, and a year later, after having established residency, I started taking classes at Los Angeles City College. <laughs> so I have been here on this campus since 1981. I've never severed my relationship. <laughs> so I went, went from being a student in 81 to being a student worker in 83, but I was still a student. And then I became a, 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 a part, uh, like a, Provisional Instructional Assistant in 89, I became a Permanent Instructional Assistant in 92, and it was concurrent with the point in time that I decided to apply to Art Center, and then I eventually started teaching part-time, teaching full-time, and eight months after teaching full-time, I became Department Chair, and I'm still here. So I'm skipping all of my photos from the 80s, and there are a lot of them. There are a lot of them. So I'm jumping now to the late 80s. This is around 1987, 1988. I was working in a one-hour photo, and I was shooting four by five negatives, and I didn't have time to get into the dark room to print the negatives, so I figured out a way that I could put my four by five negatives into an automated enlarger that was designed to print 35 millimeter negatives, so the only way I could do a four by five was to print it in parts. So these were all machine prints that were collaged together. So these pieces are about 40 inches high. They're publicity photos from a film that I made called Inside the Yellow Bird, which screened, premiered January 29, 1993, while I was a student at Art Center. And as part of a, a, a grant that I just received, I am going to be doing a 25th anniversary screening on January 28th this year, and I'm going to have swag. <laughs> so so um, those of you that came to the panel discussion that we had last, last term after our president was elected, um, know that Gronk was here talking. Gronk painted the sets and did the props to Inside the Yellow Bird. Diane Gamboa, if you know anything about Latino artists in Los Angeles, big name. She did the hats and paper dresses. Tomato Duplenty was involved with this project. Um, a, a, a underground string quartet from the 70s and 80s here in Los Angeles, fat and fucked up played live when I screened it and I recorded the sound. So I'm having the piece digitized, so I hope you could make that screening in January. So this is Lila. Lila uh, played the albatross in the Inside the Yellow Bird. Frederick Nilsson, um, famous artist and art photographer in Los Angeles, played the inspector. Nichelle Wong was the yellow bird the madam of the bordello where all the girls had dressed as birds and all the men were sailors. I guess I remade Corel. <laughs> the hummingbird, the lovebird, the mockingbird, the scarlet ibis, the cuckoo, <laughs> the bird of paradise, that brain looks like a crack. Then, like where do you get your inspiration as an artist? I mean, I don't tend to get much inspiration from other photographers. I tend to derive inspiration from other sources. I went to the Huntington Gardens and there was a book on pre-Raphaelite painters and I really didn't know that much about pre-Raphaelite painters, but I really liked the paintings. And I decided I wanted to do a series of photos that were based on pre-Raphaelite paintings. So I also was working with the idea of location photography and studio photography. I go back and forth between the two. So I had this idea that I could set up curtains in the landscape and take photos and I could sort of like turn the landscape into a studio. So that's what all of these were. This piece is called The Maleficent Aspects of Sleep. Insomnia, Somnambulism and Narcolepsy. <laughs> This one's called uh, The Three Psychoses, Paranoia, Catatonia, and Delusions of Grandeur. <laughs> Venus Veiled, Venus Revealed, Venus Revealed. <laughs> Real woman. Um, major Moments in the Life of Mary. <laughs> the, <laughs> the, the Annunciation, the, uh, the Epiphany, and the Crucifixion. 
Um, this, is, this piece is called Enamored of the Night. This was the type of work that I was doing when I got accepted into Art Center. And after my first critique as a grad student at Art Center, I was devastated because I was like, all these, like, oh, these like, really smart kids that like, had a lot of critical theory. I mean, I graduated from, I did my undergraduate work 10 years before them, and it was in the Midwest, it wasn't in, it wasn't in California. So, you know, they were all real big on critical theory, and I wasn't that big on critical theory. I was reading Charles Darwin instead of Baudrillard and Deleuze, so, uh, you know, whatever. And I'm like, how dare they say I have no concept between what I'm doing? So I launched on this project that I started calling the Vacillations, and so I was making still photographic pieces that referenced <coughs> films, because I'd always, I'd made films the entire time that I'd made photographs. And I would always, I always said that my, my, my films look more like still photos, and my still photos look more like movies, but that was irrelevant. So this piece was called Man Looking Left, Man Looking Right. And, and <laughs> so you, you see the extremes of an action, but the action is deleted from the photograph, and the movement takes place in the frame lines that exist in between the photographs. Um, Again, I was working at a one-hour photo, and we were printing on big rolls of paper, and the last 30 feet or so of the paper would get some edge fogging, and necessity is the mother of invention. I needed, I needed to figure out like, what I was going to do with these pieces, and so I took this extra paper, and I started making contact sheets, and so the, I, I would make, you can't, I realize you can't see any detail in it. But the, you get the idea that I was taking an entire roll of film and making a single print of it. So um, the vacillations, there were 37 vacillations and they were all about repeating movements where the movement is not part of the piece, you just sort of see the extremes of the movement. And this one's called Man Facing North, Man Facing South. This one's Woman on the Right, Woman on the Left. And, you know, I, I, it's just like, yeah, okay, she's on the right, she's on the left, and the frame line makes a full face. They're, they're really sort of very simple, but kind of complex as well. And I, 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 one of the things, one of the buzzwords that I told Alexandra to bring up when she introduced me was that I'm a structuralist. I think that the structure of what I do is almost more important than the, um, you know, the, the, the narrative of what I'm doing. I think the structure is incredibly important. So I, and, and the way that film is drawn through the camera becomes a, like this, this thing that I'm very much interested in. And orientation of the camera is something that I'm interested in. And I work with 4x5, and when you look through a 4x5 camera, the image is upside down. So this one is called Man Right Side Up, Man Upside Down, but every once in a while I would just turn the camera upside down, so the only way that you could tell whether he's upside down or right side up is gravity because of his hair. So again, I'm, I'm sort of like photographing something that's unphotographable, unphotographable. How do you photograph gravity? You don't. Um, and then I started making more narrative work out of these rolls of film. This piece is called Just a Conversation Piece, and this is Christina who did she posted me all through the late 80s and most, through most of the 90s. She's on the phone with Frederick, and I traced all of the, all of the, the, the wires between her house and his house while they were on the phone. So I photographed a conversation, but there's only a weird visual trace of the conversation. Like what they were talking about was totally irrelevant to what I was doing. And then, of course, you know, everything up until that point had been horizontal, and I'm like, I think I can make vertical pieces out of this. So this piece is called Melodrama on the Stairs, and if you start at the top of the stairs and you walk down, the piece orients this way, but if you start at the bottom of the stairs and walk up, everything gets kind of like flipped around in the camera. So things do not line up properly on the beach in Baila de, de Los Angeles. And then, of course, you know, if you could do it with one roll of film, you can do it with three rolls of film. <laughs> so in this piece, like, you know, uh, you know I, when, I, when I talk to my students about how to construct an image, especially an image that deals with depth of field, and I tell them, you have to have foreground, midground, and background in the shot. So one of the rolls of film was nothing but foreground, one of them was nothing but midground, and one of them was nothing but background. And then probably the best 
And I made like over 200 of these. So we're only just scratching the surface. This one's called 37 hermaphrodites. I had seven body models that posed for me, and I had to totally storyboard this out so that I made sure I had male and female body parts on every vertical alignment. And then those were 37 photo students' heads. I wasn't teaching at the time. <laughs> I was an instructional assistant. <laughs> um, this one's called Paper Doll. And Paper Doll, I filled in, I, I got these like boxes that they were selling at, the, at, at this photo store that I was going to so that you could put your family memories in them and change the photo every day. But I turned them, I, I started calling them vasilloscopes because the pieces that I was doing were vacillations. And so you could actually rotate them and you could see movement occur. So I basically made a kinetoscope out of it. And this is just a page from one of my notebooks and it was a three roll piece called Out of the Closet where Lisa Ann Auerbach, who I've done a lot of collaboration with, tried on all the clothes in her closet as I photographed her with three cameras. Probably the first major show I was in was the Lace Annuale, and I think it was 1996. And when I applied to get in that show, part of my statement talked about showing in Los Angeles and what it was like to try to show in alternative venues, and many of them were very political, so your work had to have a political agenda if you wanted to show it in the 90s, late 80s, early 90s. But it wasn't <coughs> enough to have, make work that had a political agenda. You had to make work whose you had to make work with a political agenda that aligned with the politics of the venue where you were showing. And the example that I gave when I wrote my statement had to do with the Los Angeles artist who shall remain unnamed and was called by the Women's Building to do a poster on abortion and she had a kind of squeaky voice and she said, sure, for or against, and they hung up on her. <laughs> so so I, I, this idea of for or against regarding political agendas kind of became very interesting to me. So, I started photographing people talking about the political topic of their choice. So this piece is called Lila on the Medfly, and they were doing a lot of spraying for the Medfly in the early 80s as well, all through the 80s and 90s here in Los Angeles. So she talked about the Medfly, and I photographed her, but you never know if she's for or against the Medfly, or Frederick on censorship. Well, is he for or against? And so they're all on soap boxes. These are little sculptural pieces. They're, I actually photographed people from the front and from the back, so you could walk around them. They were freestanding. Wendy on bioethics, Lisa on white supremacy. Um, and again, I just like I, like, I did not record what they said. I just gave it a title and I left it entirely up to the imagination of the person that was looking at the work. You, you decide. You decide is this person for or against, which is very much in keeping with the just a conversation piece where they were having a conversation and I never recorded it. So I, 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 I tend to do that a lot. I make work that references something, but I don't really ever come out with a statement on it. This was, there was a little reference to me showing at Blum and Poe. Um, this was my first solo show at Blum and Poe. I was in several group shows there as well. Um, and uh, I'm only showing you an installation view of that. But then these are four of the bacilloscopes that were in the back room. And these are four people reciting four different alphabets. The first one is English, the second one is Spanish, the third one is Haragana, which is the phonetic Japanese alphabet for translating foreign words that don't really have a meaning in Japanese. So if you needed to say Monica Lewinsky in Japanese, you would say it phonetically rather than characters that actually said who she was. And the fourth one was Norwegian because during, right about the time that I was doing this show, I made arrangements to do a show in Norway, and I figured as long as I was gonna do a show in Norway, I better use the Norwegian alphabet too. And so this is an installation view of my show in Norway. And there's, again, more installation views. Let's see, where are we now in time? 1998. Okay, so this is 2001. Um, I, 
This show got me a few teaching jobs, um, USC in particular. Um, so this show, um, I, I, I did an entire series of photos. I started out by, okay, I've been making work that was an entire roll of film. Then I said, I can do in two images what I'm trying to do with an entire roll of film. And that was the show that I did at Blum and Poe. This particular show, I photographed people at address numbers to correspond to the years of the 20th century. The working title was 100 Friends in No Particular Order, a Celebration of the 20th Century. After finishing 100 Friends in No Particular Order, <coughs> the artist Sabina Ott said, I don't really want to pose for your project. And I said, well, Sabina, I shot them all. I ran out of numbers. And then I called her a week later and I said, I've decided to make my, my project The History of the City of Los Angeles, which opened me up from 1781 to 1900. So it gave me 120 more dates to work with. Um, so because if you look at the city seal, Los Angeles was founded in 1781. So you walked into the gallery. That wall was built. We had to build two walls because when all of the all of the frames were lined up, I didn't have enough wall space. So we had to build two, three walls. We built three walls. And the walls were wide enough to accommodate a piece as well. So the piece totally wrapped the gallery. It's called Timeline. And I don't think I have a shot of the doorway, but the gap between the original series and the 120 additional series were the doorway into the back room. So I sort of split the project apart. That particular piece with the two frames, my, these were shot at the Hasselblad, the camera malfunction. And so I have been called the world's sloppiest structuralist as well, meaning if, if something goes wrong with the structure, it just becomes part of the work. So I actually just have one piece that was in two frames. Um, and in the back room, there was a film that I shot. So this is the closest that you're going to get to seeing one of my films. Um, it was, I went to, after I, did the 20th century pieces, I went from 1901 to 1902 to 1903 with a 16 millimeter movie camera. And I shot 24 frames of each number and I handheld them. So I made a road movie with no travel. All you see is the 100 destinations. It took three days and it was 600 miles. Going, because I, I had to do it all in order. I wasn't going to edit it. And, Lace got me money to do something a little extra, and I'm like, oh, I think we need a banner on the front of the building. So this is like, I don't know, a 20-foot high banner of me on Hollywood Boulevard. And I figured out where it was going to go, but the show was hung in December, and I didn't count on the trees growing. So I went to 5 o'clock in the morning with my gardener to bring the trees on the <laughs> And Timeline is an ongoing piece. I, I've continued shooting it. So what happens now is every year I shoot one person. Um, so Elizabeth, who's our instructional assistant now, and who's at CalArts working on her master's degree, was my model in 2008, after she was no longer my student. <laughs> and these are the four most recent ones. 2014, 15, 16, and 17. So again, this is an ongoing project. It has no end until I guess I die. <laughs> um, I applied for a grant to do a temporary project in the metro system, and my project was to photo the Wilshire Vermont station and the Sunset um, Vermont stations. And then there's a slide projector here mounted in you know, on top of the, um, I mean, these are old, these are slides. This wasn't a digital projection at the time in 2001. Um, and uh, my favorite thing about doing this project was I had to go through heavy rail trading. <laughs> so I have a vest. 
<laughs> um, but I shot all the address numbers, but I went to our then president, um, Mary Spangler, and I told her, I said, I'm doing this project, it's going to be installed at our train station right here at the school, and I can't even photograph my own job site because we don't have an address number. She goes, yes, I do, it's on the sign. I'm like, no, it's not. Within a month, there was an address number on Blossom Hall. <laughs> so I'm responsible for that address number at Los Angeles City College. And there was also a budget for me to do a brochure. And the brochure was, I keep journals. Um, I, you saw one page for my journals. So the brochure was in English and Spanish. And um, it was English on one side, Spanish on the other. It was just excerpts from my journal regarding this project. And these were little things that people could pick up in the trains and in the buses. There were also car cards. Then I did a second project with the MTA. I designed the Woodman um, uh, Orange Line station. And about three years before this, I started making quilts because, first of all, I decided I needed a hobby. I needed a hobby for my old age because it's too late to try to figure out if you want to do something. So I wanted to start young enough so that I wasn't too old to learn something new. And. Um, I, but then I was struggling with this idea because I knew that there was a relationship between the, the quilts that I was making and the photographs that I was making and the films that I was making and I couldn't figure out what it was, but I knew it was there. Um, but I was struggling with it, so I did this project. So there's a photograph of the actual quilt. The terrazzo on the floor is based on the pattern of the quilt. So, um, you know, take, take a ride on the train and see it. Oh, it's not the train, it's the bus, the rabbit bus. This was a show I did in Pasadena at a, a, a little alternative venue called Bliss. I got a grant through the city of Pasadena to do something. So I shot eight photographs and made a quilt. And the photographs all had arrows on them. And when you walked into the space, the first photograph that you encountered had an arrow that pointed you to the direction that you were supposed to walk to see the next photograph. So I sort of used the, I used the features of the photograph to guide people through the gallery. And then there was a, a video with some films that I made. Oh, so yeah, there's another film I made that no you know, U-turns on. Huh, <sighs> You know, I think that one thing that I've come to realize is that when you're an artist, no matter what you do, you're making art. It really doesn't matter what you do. Um, I have been collaborating with Lisa Ann Auerbach for many years, and she asked me, she wanted to, we, we first did the Casual Observer, which was a publication when we worked at the Griffith Observatory, and I started writing and publishing my work at that point in time. She asked me if I was interested in doing a column in her new website that she wanted to learn how to, no, she, first she wanted to do a new zine, it was American Homebody. So I went, okay, great, I'll write what's that bunch. She said, what do you mean? And I said, well, when you encounter insects in your house, everybody wants to know what they are. So when we did the first American Homebody, we had to write the letters. And then people actually started writing in. And then she designed, she wanted to learn how to design a website, so she developed American Homebody into a website. And then when it was a website, people really did have access to it on the internet, and people would actually start writing in, what's that bug got way more mail than the entire rest of the website put together? Like nobody wanted to know cleaning tips or <laughs> cooking. Like nobody, everybody wanted to know what's that bug. So Lisa said, you better buy the domain. So I bought the domain in 2002. The website is 15 years old now. I just created 25,000 postings. I've passed the 25,000 posting mark. Every one of those postings was mine. So if you know anything about blogging, that's pretty impressive. <laughs> and that led to an editor in New York contacting me saying she really liked the way I wrote and she would like to edit a book if I was interested in writing a book. And I said, well, I've never written a book before. She goes, and I said, and I have no credentials, I'm not an entomologist. And she said, I don't care, I like the way you write. <laughs> so I got an advance to write a book. And if anybody is ever trying to get it, like, that's like unheard of. If nobody ever does that. Everybody writes a book and then they try to get somebody to publish it. I did it backwards. I waited until somebody asked me to write a book before I did it. Okay, so what am I doing now? I'm still doing those, I'm still doing the, what's that, I post at least two or three postings every day. Um, 
sometimes seven or eight, if I have a lot of time for my hands. Um, in January of 2013, I called two really good friends up and I said, I have this kind of crazy idea. I want to take photographs of me in front of address numbers that correspond to 365 days of the year. Do you think it's nutty? And they both said, you should do it. So these, all of these photographs, they're, they're, each one is a triptych. It's three photos. They're shot simultaneously. The bottom photo comes first because, again, that's how the film goes through the camera. The first photo is the year. The middle photo is the month and day. And the top photo is me on that month, on that day, month, and year. So I'm time stamping all of the images with address numbers. So this is one week in September. And then in September, 2014, I showed the entire month of September 2013 at Alias Books in Atwater Village. So that's where that was. And it's installed like a calendar, because I've been making calendars since 1984, which is one of the reasons I make my students make calendars. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Yes, you may. I have six minutes left. Just about the previous one, so the year is always the same building? The year was not always the same building. I found three different buildings that had a 2013 address, but because I had to drive to two different locations, I tried to find an address number that's close to my house. Gotcha. So you always start with that one. I start with the year. And then you go off. And then I go to do the month and day. Yeah. And again, it's all edited in camera, just like my film, just like my film script pieces. I just want to remind you that I shot a lot of photos in Ohio, and things, and, and things kind of like never really go away. I think as artists, we, we oftentimes like work ideas, and you work them to death, and then you like revisit them, and then you work them again, and old ideas come back, and they get reinvented in new ways. So I bamboozled my way into a show in Youngstown, Ohio, just I went and talked to a gallery owner, and I said, look, I said, I, I, I grew up here, I took photos here. Every time I come back, I take photos here. I would really like to do a show of Ohio work and California work. And I had the Ohio work. I was shooting these obelisks. Um, they were address markers. They were not address markers. They were intersection markers. So again, I'm really interested in time and space and the movement of bodies through space and using spatial markers to, to, to be to be markers for time and like you know all of this it, it's kind of really convoluted and trust me in 45 minutes I cannot even scratch the surface of what's been going on here for 40 years so but uh, you know hopefully you'll get a little hint of it so I, I knew what I was going to do in Ohio I wanted to do the obelisk but I had no idea what I was going to do in California so I came back I contacted my contractor and I said I need a camera platform so instead of a tripod, this camera platform is 10 feet above my patio floor, and I could mount a 4 by 5 camera to it and aim it straight down without um, having to worry about the camera tipping over. And I finally figured out how to combine photography and bulk making. So this is from 2005. Um, this is Odalisk number two. So I like the idea of the show is called Obelisks and Odalisks, and I just really like the idea that the two words rhyme, even though they have nothing in common. And they're not even spelled the same, but at the end of the day, they're both really sexual things. I mean, you know, the, the, I, I sat through Biz Lopez's lecture on the Odalisks, and you know, like the whole idea of the male gaze and like looking like these things were supposed to be in private and then the obelisks are total phallic symbol so you know I don't know. I made this very loaded show. Um, and so these are some of my odalisks and they're reclining the, 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 the traditionally the odalisk is a reclining female nude in a very sumptuous setting. Um, obviously I'm dealing with flat space and not depth. Um, but what I did was, there, and they're shot 4x5 negative, so I correct the perspective. So all of the verticals are vertical and the horizontals are horizontal, so the books are really nice grids. Um, and then I had them drum scanned and printed so the quilts are to scale, which means the female models are slightly larger than life size. 
we maybe don't want to stay on that one too long. We don't want people to recognize anyone here, do we? Um, <laughs> this one I showed in the gallery here created a little stir. <coughs> And, you know, again, I, I was really interested in working with people that were friends of mine. So, um, the, I originally, and I, I looked at the space in Ohio and I'm like, okay, I can fit seven life-size photos in here. And then, these are installation views of the show. These are the obelisks. They show downstairs in a small gallery. And then, the upstairs room held the odalisks. And I flew Frederick Nielsen, who you saw earlier as the inspector who photographs everybody's art in Los Angeles. Um, I flew him out to shoot the show because when you're going to have a show in Youngstown, Ohio, you better have good documentation of it. <laughs> yes? Um, I just wonder, because I know you said you worked with a lot of your friends uh, a couple of times, that um, when you shot the people you knew, did you ever find, like, either during or afterwards, did it ever get kind of awkward, or like, was it, like, not, not on my part. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, I just no. thought, because I actually thought, I thought about doing that because I thought it would be easier to do it with someone that I knew than, like, hiring a model. I don't like, I don't like to hire people, I, I never hire people, I've never hired a model, and I actually really don't like working with people I don't know. Because, well, I was just thinking about it, because then after I thought about asking somebody, I tried to, and then I thought maybe I shouldn't have asked. So I, I guess I just wondered what... Okay, well, that, you need to work out your team. Sure. <laughs> no problem with them. are <laughs> okay, they're drum scan and they're light jet prints. Because we want to get this technology here when we have the money to get it. But we're, we're outputting from a digital file back to photographic paper. So they're, they're true photographic prints. It's just done with a digital darkroom. So it's a true hybrid process. And I had to include like people in all of the, um, all of the installation views so that you would have a sense of scale. And there's me at my show. And I'm continuing to, to shoot these as well. These are the ones that I've shot since the show. Um, none of these are printed big yet. Christina, who was working with me all through the, um, all through the 80s and 90s. I loved that some of my models came out of retirement to, to pose for me. I found out after um, she posed for me that she's an, uh, she writes about art theory. <laughs> so, whatever, good connection. Did she say anything about her uh, composition? She was, I, there, there's a really interesting photo of her in, like, nude, like, looking at the print in my studio and talking about it. It's kind of funny. Um, this one I was very excited about. Lila came out of, she, Lila has, used to do figure posing. I think she probably posed here for art classes, too. But she's, she posed everywhere. She hasn't posed for about 15 years. She told me I was the only one she would come out of retirement to pose for. And this was shot during the eclipse. So this was when we had 63% of the surface of the sun covered by the moon. And the light is crazy, but you look at it and you kind of don't know why it's crazy, but it just is. So, after the odalisks, I decided I needed to do a companion series of male models. So they're standing instead of lying down, they're vertical orientation instead of horizontal orientation, and they're on the back sides of the quilts instead of the front sides of the quilt. And instead of them being flat space with me using the 4x5 view camera to correct all the perspective aberration out of the photos, here I use the lens and I, photo, I, I focus on the model's eyes and then the model's feet and I take the, the, everything out of alignment so that the vertical plane of the body becomes the plane of focus. So the plane of focus is no longer parallel to the lens. So it's total camera geek stuff. Very camera geek. And I don't have very many of the Davids shot yet, but they're all posed like the Statue of David, and they break the pose just to look up when I shoot the photo. This is a brand new piece. This is from 2017. 
You might not know it's 2017 because my address number is an anagram for the year. So I finally got to use my address number as one of my own locations. And that's the four seasons. You know, the first one is winter, spring, summer, fall. It's also the four elements, and it's also the four suits from a tarot card deck. And again, these are things that have appeared through my work for many years. Unfortunately, those things did not appear in this slideshow because I can only show you a little bit. Um, and this was my one solo show last year at the Southwest Museum. I did an installation with quilts. And I think that's my last slide, but it's not the last thing I want to show you. Um, several of my quilts, like this one in the foreground, are, are actually incorporating photographic processes. I've coated fabric with uh, cyanotype emulsion, which is light sensitive, and then I can make photograms of the plants in my yard. That's what I've been doing, and I made this one over the weekend. And I'm very happy with this one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry I went five minutes over, but I think I started five minutes late. Yeah. <laughs> no questions? Should we save these questions to the end, maybe? Okay. Then we have a little. Okay, fine. <laughs> Is that okay, just then, in case people have to leave early? That's fine. That? Okay. I'm okay with that. Oh, one last thing I would like to say. Lisa and I have entertained the idea of her posing as an Oculus Award. Should she do it? Astrid, you must have a question. My question is more like, may I be a model as well? <laughs> Once you're no longer a student, I'm not a student. <laughs> <laughs> well, I already asked one. Do you want to go first? Yes, talk to us about the film that's coming up. <coughs> Which one? Well, the one you just There's made. There's the 25th anniversary film. Yeah. We're talking about the new one. The new one. I just made a film called Tetralogy of the Seasons. Tetralogy is just a fancy word for four seasons. Um, and I did a film in my yard that's just about the four seasons. And um, the composer seems to have left the room. Dr. Warner, who teaches in the music department, has agreed to compose original music for the film. The film, being that it's four seasons, it's four parts. The first one is The Rite of Spring, the second one is Summer Fever, the third one is Autumn Waltz, and the fourth one is Old Man Winter. They're four song titles. Um, and Dr. Warner is going to somehow take the themes of that music and filter it through Vivaldi's Four Seasons, which is the classic Four Seasons. And um, I hope to be screening it with live music in the near future. The film, I just got, I, I sent, I shot it on Super 8. It's in Canada right now being made into a 16 millimeter inner negative in print um, because I don't want to keep projecting the original film. So I will have a new film out soon. And I, I've made two films in the last two years, and I hadn't made a film in 13 years, so I'm excited to be making films again. Making films is more expensive than shooting photos. Uh, do you prefer Mercado? Do you like more of black and white? 
Oh my goodness, that was, a, that was a common question in the 80s, and I think I have the same answer. It's whatever the subject dictates. Like sometimes the subject is a black and white subject, and sometimes the subject is a color subject. And I think that I let the subject dictate whether I'm going to shoot color in black and white. It's not really that big of an issue now because people shoot everything digitally and they can just remove the color. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. So I noticed early on you were you, you used title plate. Title. Oh plate. yeah, I used to have brass plates. And there. then and then they were shown framed. So I'm like wondering like. Well, first of all, are they addition or is, are they unique? Are those thought of as unique? Prints? Yes. And most of those things are no longer in my possession. When I moved, I had a move, and I sold everything for like $50 to $100. So you made one print? No, there's multiple prints, but there's only one of the prints. And that's the one. And that's the one. And those things are scattered through the floor. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't do that anymore. You, in terms of the titling, including the title. I haven't, I haven't had any titling. Yeah, I did that for the Yeah, I'm over that. Yes. Can we save the question? Oh, she did. I think um, otherwise we'll run out of time. Save it though. At the okay. end, we'll leave more room for questions. Okay. Hi. Um, so I'm Lisa Dyer, and I teach art appreciation, art 103, art history 103, and intro painting and watercolor. Um, I am a visual artist. That is uh, based here in LA. I earned my MFA from Cal State LA in 2014 and have been very fortunate um, in my short path to have had some really great opportunities to show work and to um, participate in residency abroad. And I'll show some of that, those works. So um, I'll start kind of from the beginning. That's not me as a child, but um, kind of the a, a time in my life that kind of really made me focus what I was doing. I was in grad school and painting and not really sure what I wanted to do or why I was making the work I was making. And um, I really stopped to make time to figure out what was going on in my world that uh, I was concerned about. And um, so I didn't take any studio classes. I just was taking lecture classes. And when I was at home, I was very aware of, you know, I'd be at home cleaning, cooking, doing whatever. The television was on the background. And I became very aware that these judge shows were constantly on. You know, judge Mae Young, Judge Joe Brown, Judge Maybelline. And there was always a woman that was suing a man for some reason. She loaned him money, bought him clothes, something, and he was always supposed to repay her, and he never did. So I started thinking, and there's women, girls from 18 years old to women, you know, in their 60s. And I started thinking, what are we teaching our daughters? Like, you know, what, what is it that we're doing that women keep doing this, you know? So I had photographed, uh, filmed my daughter when she was little. And at this time, my daughter was in high school, and she uh, had, had a boyfriend and was having these, comparing herself to other girls. And uh, I started making work about women and how we think about ourselves and how we self-identify and gender and all of these things. So I did this piece called Lip Gloss which is a video. Oh, is it right? <coughs> oh. oh. And it's off the sound. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the sound should be. Okay. Okay. There's I'm just, it's okay. Um, sorry, because I made a video of my daughter um, from when she was six, and you only hear our conversation from my voice. And it's a bit better. So anyway, I record myself having this conversation with my daughter about her inexperience with boys. And um, you don't hear her at all, but you hear my response, which leads you to understand what this conversation is about. So this is one of the earliest, earlier works that I did. This was in 2014, before I uh, earned my MFA, um, with me addressing these issues. And unfortunately, yeah, audio's up. Um, at the same time, as I'm in grad school, I hadn't been making, uh, I had stopped making paintings. Um, I have a sister who's bipolar, paranoid, schizophrenic. And um, she, I bought her a cell phone. She lives a very nomadic life. One day she's in LA, a week later we'll find out she's in Miami or 
or New York or uh, New Mexico. So I buy her a cell phone um, so she can contact us, and she starts leaving me these very uh, strange and vital messages. She believes I'm a demon. She believes I have, uh, you know, crystal ball. And I'm changing her face. I have a nephew, her son. She believes, you know, I've eaten him. I've done horrible things to him. Um, at the same time, there are other things happening in the world, and I start thinking about um, the effects of planets and moons on our psyche um, and this relationship between the earthly, uh, the earth itself, the earthly and the human body and celestial body. So I start making these small works on small um, canvas, unstretched canvas. I'm resonating with the circle. And then um, these pieces become long, larger and they're six foot by six foot. And they become these abstract metaphors for human experiences that have taken place on Earth. Um, of course, because we are humans on Earth. Um, but that they have taken place here historically. So they deal with racism and natural uh, catastrophes. Um, so the first one in this series is Celestial Body Number 1963. They also have a uh, for the lack of a better description, a scientific name and a layman's term. And so it's tell the court I love my wife. And the first painting on the left is for the Lovings. Richard, if any of you know the story of the Lovings, Richard and Mildred Loving, who were an interracial couple in Virginia, and it was illegal for them to marry. The second one, uh, Celestial Body, 19, I'm oh, sorry, that was 19, uh, I'm sorry, my dates. That was 1963, 1958, I believe it was the second one. Uh, on the hands of each of us for the three little girls that were killed in the Southern Church uh, when the bomb, um, white supremacist threw a bomb in the black church. And then we have uh, Celestial Body 2005 um, that was for uh, Hurricane Katrina. So I'm making these paintings that are responding to uh, human events. Um, again, they're acrylic and oil and they're six feet by six feet. And six feet by six feet is the largest I can make in my space. I really wanted them to be eight feet by eight feet and ten by ten. Uh, and this one uh, is called A Big Dog and Ugly Woman, Two Shotguns and a Claw Hammer. This is graffiti that was found on a house in uh, um, Louisiana, in New Orleans, um, during Hurricane Katrina. So I'm making these works that uh, are questioning this relationship between uh, madness and spirituality, between human bodies and celestial bodies. And these are two paintings I made for my grandmother and my sister. My grand maternal grandmother um, was very abusive to my sister, and we believe was one of the reasons why my sister is mentally ill to this day. And so these two paintings. Um, them. This one was from my grandmother, Celestial Body, 1911. So the scientific dates for these celestial bodies, um, I looked up how planets um, are identified or are named, and they take on the, the number correlates to the year that they were first seen. So this is the year of her birth. Um, and there's some other configurations there. But this one is also called He Got Her Drunk First. And then um, 1971, she finally called. So with this work, these are the celestial bodies, I have these tumors that I made. And the tumors are made of chicken wire and hydrocal and synthetic hair. And these relate to my sister directly. Um, at this time, again, my sister's leaving me these messages. But my sister's also obsessed with fake hair. She wears wigs. She believes they change her identity. She believes they change her ethnicity, that she can become another woman. She changes her name. And so I make these. Uh, celestial, I'm me, I make these tumors, which are an acronym for terrifying, unfortunate memories of rage and sadness, as a way to exercise this pain from my, uh, my body. The reason why um, I wanted to exercise this from me, and I'm not saying exercise as an exercise, but exercise as a demon, um, I'm also, like a lot of happen, right? I'm in grad school, I'm questioning these things, I'm a single mom, I have a sister that's mentally ill, and I happen to also watch this documentary called Girl Model anybody's ever seen it. It's about the modeling and the chain of burden that comes with that. So I started making these tumors. And hair is associated with literally hair that could be uh, formed in these tumors, but also they um, relate to my sister's obsession with synthetic hair. Um, and again, I had audio that goes with this. So inside of these tumors are iPods, and a, a little iPod and a speaker. There's an uh, iPhone. There are
are little devices and there's audio. So there's my voice um, um, uh, replaying or, or acting out, um, re-dramatizing the messages that my sister would leave me. So one of the tumors is weeping and mumbling very low. Another one every now and then shouts these loud, horrible, uh, violent accusations. Um, but some of them you have to get really close to listen to, and it's literally the sickness speaking. Um, after that, that's 2014, I um, have a solo show, my first solo show after graduating, at um, the Nanway Gallery in Woodbury, at Woodbury University. And I'm still working with, um, I started making this other work, um, but I'm still working with these celestial bodies. And these become a little more personal. They become more about me and my experiences. And they're no longer these portraits of celestial bodies, but they become uh, the, the energy within those celestial bodies kind of break out and begin to cover the canvas. So the, uh, the oil that I'm including um, in these works become smaller celestial bodies. So this is an installation of the information. And a detailed texture shot. And um, I included video in the work. So again, all of this work is relating to um, um, human experiences, madness, um, relationships. And so I have these celestial bodies that are then um, looking at, the, at that are these abstract metaphors for human experiences. And then I have video that uh, document locations from my childhood where I observed actual violence or perceived violence. And I return to, um, yeah, I so this one is called Grim Paul um, Pink Lemonade. And I return to um, a home, an apartment, uh, where my father used to live when my sister and I were younger. And it was a home where only men lived. And there were about eight units at the time. Now it's a duplex that's been divided in half and there were two very large four bedroom um, duplexes. And um, it was at this duplex where we would have to go, or this apartment rather, where we'd have to go every Sunday to visit my father. And there was a man, my father lived in the bottom, I don't have a close up, but he lived in the bottom front apartment, and above him, the window that's to the top right, um, the man named Mr. Campbell lived there. And we would visit, and uh, my father introduces me to Mr. Campbell, and I remember the very first time we met him, and I talk about this in the video. So it's a black and white video, it looks like a photograph, but you see the, uh, the cars driving by, you see the leaves blowing in the wind, and I narrate uh, from memory my experience at this duplex, and I uh, talk about meeting Mr. Campbell for the first time, and him opening his door, and you know, uh, photos of naked women you know, from magazines are taped to the walls, and he doesn't have a shirt on, and as children, as small girls, that's a very unnerving thing to see. You know, my mother didn't expose us to people like this, or men like this. So um, my father lived in the front room, and it's just a room. And there was this really long, dark hallway, and there was a kitchen. My father taught us how to make pink lemonade, uh, you know, for concentrate. And so one day, <laughs> um, it's February, I give Mr. Campbell a, innocently a Valentine's Day card. and. Um, because, you know, I'm a kid and I don't see women there, so I assume he has no family. And we go back months later, and I'm in the kitchen making pink lemonade. And I hear someone behind me, and Mr. Campbell is in the doorway. And so I tell the story about making this pink lemonade and stirring it, and looking into the picture as the well is developing, because I continue to stir it as Mr. Campbell asks me about this Valentine's Day card, and what it meant, and why I chose to give it to him. And I just know that there's something very wrong with this picture. Um, and then the other one was me, uh, excuse me, the corner of, I, I went to the corner of Crenshaw and Venice and stood in the street with my camera and I stole, I shouldn't tell you, I couldn't afford one at the time, I stole a, uh, one of those called the orange cones and put it in so I wouldn't get hit by a car. But I did return it. I found it on the street and I did return it. Um, so I stood there and I filmed the corner and then I retell the story about being in elementary school and watching two men fight on the street. Um, so in the summer of 2016, I had an opportunity to have a second solo show and it was called In Between. And it was me looking at 
in my life and where I am and my status as a woman when it comes to relationships and moving in this world. And I'm no longer in my 20s. I'm not close to my 60s in any way. I'm this woman in between. And I am thinking about how I look and how I feel and, again, how I move in this world. So I made this video, this installation that is uh, comprised of two videos. Uh, one of me in my 30s, where there's text that reads about this experience I have going to Home Depot and locking eyes with a younger man. And um, then this older gentleman referring to me as a tall glass of water. Tall people were referred to as a tall glass of water, like we're refreshing on a hot day. So um, I have this installation of six objects that I identify. Uh, this tall glass of water, which is like this vase full of water, a diamond cake, which is a cake with a vagina in it, um, grass, melons, prunes, and these socks with uh, rocks in them. And I identify them in this video and talk about what they mean and how I, I have been, my body parts have been referred to things to eat or consume or women in general. So this is just a clip of stills from it, identifying those six areas. And then there's no audio in this video, but um, it's two minutes. I won't play the whole thing, but you can just get an idea of what it looks like. So this, this was on one wall. So this was footage you shot when you were 30? I shot this in my 30s, yeah, okay. and I just used it in 20 and So um, it goes on to identify these, um, uh, these six ways. And then on the other side of the room, parallel to that video, is a video of a 60-year-old woman, a woman in her 40s, and a woman uh, who just turned 21. And they're doing these synchronized moves. And um, uh, this really looks at these real, but also these uh, perceived or assumed ways in which our bodies look different. And yeah. <laughs> the neck and then bridge to the torso and then to the legs. Um, so, while that show was um, on exhibit, I had been accepted to the Georgia Feet Artist Writer in Red, uh, Art, Georgia Feet Artist Writer Summer Residency in Paris. I wrote a proposal called The Necessity of French Cafes, where I wanted to document Black Americans living in Paris, and initially I wanted to learn from them um, how their decision to move to Paris and living in Paris was informed by black people that have come before them, whether they were soldiers from World War II, Josephine Baker, and all of this. So I wrote a proposal, was accepted. I, I recommend everyone applying for it. You do not have to have a degree to get it, but you do have to write well. I was just on the selection committee for the winter um, resident, and um, only about 150 people apply each time. It's definitely doable. You get a $2,000 stipend, they fly in Paris, and give you a good work So I recommend everyone for it. So I go to Paris and I meet black folks who live in Paris. Um, there are a lot, and I'm in the American, I just mean everywhere you look, there are.
there are tons of Africans and people from Martinique and Guadeloupe and different parts of the world. Uh, so many that sometimes you wonder, well, wouldn't they take photos in the streets of Paris? They must tell them to move. Like, how is it going to be photos? Um, so the first day, well, the first week I get there, um, I meet the woman at the top. Her name is Kwan Lene Green. She was actually just there for a few days writing her memoir. It's her second time. And then I met the woman um, below her, Veronica, who um, speaks fluent French. Uh, she lived in France when she was in her 20s, went back to the United States and married an American. Only spoke French to her three children. Her husband spoke English to them. When she divorced her husband, he said, you can take the kids to Paris. And she moved to Paris with her children who were like two, four, and six at the time. And um, I met other folks. So I photographed them. I interviewed them. I recorded their the interview, and then I transcribed it. Um, the transcribing took much longer than I thought, so I only uh, posted one <laughs> interview. But I did write essays in response to my time there. Um, why Paris was imprinted on my spirit since I was a child, and I made, wrote poems and made uh, watercolor drawings and other things. Um, so if you Google the Necessity of French Cafe, it's what I um, So while I was in Paris, yes? What was the name of the Georgia, the residency is called the Georgia Fee, F-E-E. -E. Is that through Artsland? Yes. Yeah. Georgia Fee founded Artsland. Um, so while I was in Paris, I um, was there from uh, July to June, to the end of July. I took a break, went to London. And it was while I was in London that I learned of the deaths of Philando Castile and Alton Sterling. I had no idea who they were. My cousin sends me a text saying, what do you think about Alton Sterling? And I'm in England, so I'm thinking like, it's Prime Minister or somebody with that name. And I'm like, I have no idea. So I look it up. And I actually turn on the television and it's on the news. So I'm like, what? So I'm there doing things and this idea for an installation comes to me. So I created an installation. My, my residency culminates in an installation. And I um, buy espresso cups for every black person that was killed in um, the United States by police. Um, during my residency, and I fill them up with varying levels of coffee while I'm there. And I'm wondering that if Philando Castile and Alton Sterling had been in Paris, living in Paris, had the experience I had, I did not feel any microaggressions while I was in Paris. I am not saying that racism does not exist because we know that it does. Um, but if they had had a different experience and didn't realize that their black bodies were on the radar of police, would they still be alive? Would their lives be different? And so I created, it, and it wasn't important to me whether or not the black folks that were killed by police were uh, innocent or guilty. It didn't matter if they were armed or unarmed. Um, I have an espresso cup with varying levels of coffee for everyone. But it is a code. So if the candles are on, are facing the right, and there's only one that we see, they are unarmed. If they're facing the left, they are armed. If it's a full cup of coffee, then they are non-threatening. If, um, if it's empty, that means they committed homicide or grave bodily harm. If there's residue, they were threatening and um, you know, it was halfway, they were unarmed and threatening. Like there was this code. So um, I also published a zine while I was there uh, about my experience and poems and things in it with uh, this um, illustrative code for decoding the expression. And so I found a gallery space that would let me use the floor. They already had art up. I was trying to find an empty space, but um, I had these personal cups lined up on the floor. And then I invited um, black Americans who were living in Paris um, to participate in my installation because these people, I thought, epitomized freedom and the purpose of living in Paris. And so the, uh, the the title of my residency comes from a James Baldwin essay called People in Paris. And in this essay, Baldwin writes about living in Paris, meeting an American in his hotel, and his, his American gives him a sheet. He does not know that the sheet has been taken from a, or stolen, I should say, from a hotel. And the French police come and they arrest James Baldwin and this other guy. Uh, James Baldwin is black, this other guy is white, and they put them in jail. And, um, but in the writing, um, Literally, I think it's the first paragraph, first sentence of the second paragraph, where he's describing these decrepit, horrible, cold, dank Parisian um, hotels, and he writes, 
when you're sitting at a cafe outside drinking your coffee, he now understands the necessity of the French cafe. So the French cafe for me became this metaphor for luxury and freedom and all the things that black Americans at that time were not experiencing, but they can experience them in France. Black men who fought in war, were discriminated against, could not marry whoever they wanted to, but they could go to Paris and marry white women if they wanted, and nothing would happen. So these people, um, the way they're living their lives, and pursuing art, most of the people I met were musicians and singers. Um, I thought, again, imbibed me with this idea. I also included interviews and photographs, and the guy in the middle is from Cameroon, um, other um, uh, French nationals and immigrants because black Americans are not living in an isolated bubble in Paris. They, are, they have friends and lovers and spouses and colleagues of all types of folks. So I included other people as well. So a uh, teacher dog as well. Um, so in 2017, I applied for a fellowship with the Women's Building, and um, my proposal is accepted, and I return to Teacher Dog as well um, um, as, a, as this fellowship project. Initially, this project, unfortunately, I don't have images, began as photographs of these spiritual recipes, things that I heard or that I that came to me in dreams. Um, leave a a lit candle and a clear glass of water in a window to bring a loved one home. Um, there's a photograph of a bowl of water collecting um, rainwater, collect water from a natural source from, will you do, from which you'll do your work. So I returned to this project, uh, Teach It All as well, um, as a narrative collecting project where I archive narratives, things that women specifically have learned from other women in their lives, their mothers, grandmothers, aunts, whomever. Um, so um, I wanted to honor women and their stories to show that I value them. So part of the project was me and Laurel has a woman. Um, um, hand screen printing tote bags with this message, teach your daughter to well in English and Spanish. Um, so they're printed on each side and when a woman shared her narrative with me, and sometimes a woman didn't share a narrative, I just met her on the train or something, and, she liked my bag and was interested in the project. I gave her a bag because these bags then became um, these weapons, but you know, positive weapons. They became these signs for us to carry as we go out into the world and to remind the community to teach our daughters well. Now, I have to say that when I collected these narratives, some of them are very questionable. I did question whether these were positive or negative. Um, um, teaching to think, you know, learn things that they learn from their mothers because you only can learn from your mother or whomever where they're at, right? So um, there's a book that people could write narratives in. This exhibition it culminated in an exhibition at Album 50, and then I had framed uh, narratives. It's in English and Spanish for two reasons. One, I'm raising an Afro Latina with roots in Colombia, and so I wanted to acknowledge and honor that. But also, I wanted to empower my Spanish-speaking sisters here in Los Angeles with a very large Spanish-speaking population. So I wanted this message to be able to go in multiple communities. And so um, I don't have images of them framed, but these are a couple of uh, some of the uh, narratives I received. So one woman said uh, she was always taught never to tell a woman friend that her husband is unfaithful. Um, when I asked why, she said because a woman might already know. Um, and I've, oftentimes, if you intercede, then you know they took a couple turns on you. Now I have a very quick, a couple of times we have story about that one. Me being in my early twenties and naive and not having ever heard this. One day I'm getting my hair done in West Hollywood, and I'm at this beauty salon, and this woman is under the dryer. Or, or I guess she's not under yet. She's talking or whatever. She, she's sitting there and she's telling the entire salon that she has this man. And he is, these are little environments. He's from Jamaica and he's a vegetarian and he knows about herbs and he's an amazing chef and she has his baby. And I'm thinking, there's only one Jamaican I know of who's a vegetarian chef and he knows all about herbs and he does not have a baby. He is married. And I open my mouth and I'm like, is his name so and so? And the whole salon stops. <laughs> and she looks and she says, yes. And everybody's like, ooh. I'm like, oh no, no. So when I heard this, 
sounds like you know, really true. Like as a friend, I can as a you know somebody who's oh, like 21, I could not have to. Um, and another woman, um, mother taught her marry a light skinned man with good hair. If you will have you, your children will improve the race. Good hair for black people means your hair is straight closer to a white person's hair or a non-black person. Um, turn on the lights, look at it. If it looks like it has two eyes, don't go any further. A mother's teaching her daughter before sex. You can assume with the object that she has have two eyes. <laughs> and then a Cuban woman shared with me, if you need money, light a yellow candle and let it burn out. So I asked her, she couldn't be pregnant. She said, no, yellow is for a shoe. You know, shoe is the fact that's associated with love. Um, and then again, here are some of the participants, um, people that I know, but also again, people that I know on the street. So my work has moved from, my work has always been about stories. I love objects and I love stories and I write. And the, my work, um, I still paint, um, but my work at this moment is really about collecting these narratives and the work manifesting in different ways. I think there are men who really wanted to be involved and share their stories. Um, so this is where I start writing. Um, so when I was in graduate school, I began um, using synthetic hair um, as a storyteller. So um, from human hair, you can find uh, you know, information about your DNA, your body, all sorts of things. Um, actually, your father's lineage, from what I've read, from human hair. I wasn't interested in using human hair. But I was interested in using synthetic hair, this hair that black women use when we get our hair braided and get leaves. And so um, I wanted to create these works again that use narratives. It's all my writing based on things that I've observed or experienced in my own life. And um, I started applying this hair and creating to canvas and creating my own fonts to write these stories. And so this one reads misled by his misuse of the word exotic. She refused to get a job. Instead, she worked what her mama gave her. Her erotic, exotic became the currency she lacked in her rock wallet. Was that Sherman Avenue 50, 50 also? No. I've seen this somewhere, but I don't know. Oh, it was here. Oh. Maybe it was here. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. it's about I, I, I saw the Avenue. And then this was the first one. I have others that I have not, of course, photographed yet that I'm now using straight hair in cursive writing. Um, this was the very first one I made, and it reads, she touched without asking. Although it looked rough, it was softer than expected. It smelled of herbs and foreign rituals. It was greasy, anxiously she wiped her fingers. So initially, this work was about black women's experience with non-black people just walking up to us and touching our hair. Um, but then it became more about uh, the female body and trespasses against the body. Um, I don't have any photographs of them that I included here, but the work that I'm doing now um, is uh, also on some level of performance. I collect hair that I find on the street. So if you live in a neighborhood where there are black people, you have probably seen hair on the street. There's tufts of hair, there are braids. And so I collect those hair with gloves. And um, I document where I collect them and the time. And then I also photograph black women with braids and who are wearing fake hair. And um, this series is called She Left Evidence of Her Existence, um, although no one claimed to have seen her. And it comes from me being invited to participate in, while I'm talking, I can actually, uh, while I'm talking, um, this, uh, let's see, I can show you some. Um, so um, when I was in, uh, last summer I was invited to participate in, uh, a show at uh, Satellite in, uh, in Miami. And so this is, I just photographed, I photographed hair. Some of them just might be, you know, I would have edited this and added, but I find hair in the street, I photograph it, I also make videos so you can hear the sounds around it. I don't know what you can really see. I know I'm really good at this time. So I was invited to be in this show at Satellite. And um, the premise of the show, I was told, this is all synthetic hair. And I'm good now. I can drive with a friend. I'm like, pull over this hair over there. And he's like, not this hair. I'm like, I can tell. I'm like, I'm right the <laughs> or my dog is like really embarrassed. And I'm not sure. Like, this is the craziest one, right? OK, so like, here's some other little bits of hair. Like, 
like, you know, small things. Like, I saw this from a car. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, anyway, I get this report, but look at this. Now, this is real. We found the look how much hair is there. We're like, oh my God. I was like, I can't not take this hair. Right? And so I was like, I'm kind of like, I, this is not going to fit in the bag. So, like, we were emptying things in my daughter's car so I can have all these bags and not tell her. So, uh, uh, and then women that I found in the street, I was still doing. So I'm invited to participate in the show, and the, and the statement says, artists are gentrifiers, and the leaders are gentrifiers, developers come, and blah, 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 and we leave gentrification. And I was thinking, ain't nobody following me to French on Florence. And nobody cares what kind of coffee I'm drinking. I don't know any black artists that people are following them to come to this space. And I said, everywhere we are, so we're already here, and people are coming, and they're using words I've heard people always at a on Adams at a pizza place, and this woman comes, she's like, I'm so glad I discovered this area. And we're like, oh, we've been here, we've even discovered this area. Um, and the language really does sound like colonizers, right? These people coming to you know, develop and make it livable, uh, this, this wasteland livable. So I um, started photographing objects that I found on the street, and I have been aware as a shopper that there's a lot of, uh, this is actually a student at Ellison College a lot of um, hair on the street. So I said, you know, this is evidence that these people were here before whatever this project was came here. So I started photographing it and photographing women. But initially, I wasn't collecting the hair. I was like, I'm not crazy. And then I'm like, I need this hair. So um, it's really interesting because I've gone through all these emotions where I'm walking down the street and there's hair. And I'm like, I step on the hair and I pretend like I'm tired. <laughs> and, uh, you know, or, you know, one of the, the, the only hair that I regret not getting is I was on the corner of Brea and Romeo, uh -huh. where I live. And it was like 8 15 in the morning, so there's a lot of traffic, and there was this fabulous piece of hair on the corner, and I just could not bring myself to pick it up with everybody looking. And then I was in um, Kaiser Hospital, and I was like, God is supporting my profit. Is there hair in the hospital? But I could not bring myself to pick up the hair because in the hospital I was thinking of disease. And germs, and then later I just like, you know, wherever it is, I have to have it. So I just pick up here everywhere. So, um, so that's more.
So I think that I do tend to make projects that have a finite end specifically, and then there are others that are open-ended, like the timeline project is about numbers as well. But that, I mean, every new year brings one new piece to the project now. So I, I, I think I do tend to close things out. For the, for the most part, it's supposed to leave them open. And again, the, the, the end is usually predetermined. Because otherwise, I wouldn't know when to end something. Yeah, some of that for me is just my own issues with perfectionism. To make it end up in the bill. Is it hurts like for you like to watch? I mean to to see the to see your own work like it hurts you to see your own work like thinking about? No, it doesn't hurt me to see it. Um, I love those tumors and of course I can keep all of them. It doesn't hurt me to see it. It's more painful to see the current person and to know that I, I don't know what to do for her. I think it's more painful to know that she's still in that situation. I was thinking about the memory of it, but yeah, it's basically no. a memory. No. Yeah, you knew that I thought she had a memory. Oh, okay. Oh. Um, have you ever gotten to a point where your art has plateaued? Um, or do you know how you will solve a problem if your artistry has plateaued and you just can't um, keep, I guess, talking about subjects that tend to drain you? Like, how do you get past that? Um. I don't think I've experienced that. Well, okay, so I didn't show this one series with, with synthetic hair that I did, and I made these abstract paintings. They're on my website. Um, I don't really address them, but they are there. Um, if you look at hair. Um, so I made these. After, so someone told me that when you are in grad school, you do not uh, keep working on the grad school work. You do something new. So I had started that hair text work. I made the, the alphabet, and no one had seen it. So I was like, I am wrapping this up, and no one's going to see this, and I'm going to work on this when I'm out of grad school. So I stopped making those celestial body paintings. I started working on this new body of work, got into a show, got a good response, but they did not sell, and so the gallery did not want to have anything to do with it. And so I said, well, maybe I stopped making those celestial body paintings too soon, but there's more that I need to say. And then I made those pieces, had that my first solo show, work sold. I was so glad that I continued those, and I still have work to do with those in grow. I then went back to working on those hair pieces, but in a different way. So I, I, I won't say that I've, I've, I've only been making art quote unquote professionally since I've gotten my MFA in 2014, and I don't feel like I've plateaued. I think you are alive. You have life experience. Well, this is just for me. I'm writing. I'm writing proposals. I have ideas all the time. I have to keep making. I find that when I keep making, when you're making as an artist, you exercise. You literally are exercising your art muscles and you're generating ideas. And you know, my work takes different forms, so I have not experienced that yet for myself. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, no. <laughs> I mean, I, I, my art career is a very different trajectory, I and mean, I, I did a lot of showing in Los Angeles in the '80s, all these in alternative spaces, bars, restaurants, coffee shops, and stuff like that. So I, I have a I have pretty good underground exhibition record before I went to grad school. I went to grad school. I was 10 years older than most of the people I was in grad school with. Um, and then I actually purposefully put my art career on hold when I started teaching. Um, and now as, I mean, I'm 60 now, and I am ready. I mean, I think the time, time is different for everyone. And, you know, I mean, I, I feel, I, in a certain sense, I feel bad for, for grad students now that, that feel like they have to have a major gallery by the time they graduate and they need to have a show. And, like, artists that are having retrospective shows at 35 years old, I mean, <laughs> I, I think maybe that person plateaued, but I think I've made some stronger work than I've ever made right now. So, 
you know, I'm biding my time. I don't feel pressure. I have a certain sense of security, and I'll, when things happen, they happen. Well, I would, in fact, I'll respond to that in that, as someone who just turned back in the Bay in 2014, that there is a lot of pressure. You know, there are certain schools, depending on where you go, I went to Cal State LA, no one is looking at us when we graduate from Cal State No one is thinking about us and checking on us. And so there's a lot of work that you feel that you have to do to catch up or to be seen or to be noticed, and it can be extremely stressful. You know, there are certain people who go to, there's certain, the people who go to certain schools and immediately galleries are looking at them, you know. And you're like, how are these people getting working? I'm making this fabulous stuff and no one's writing about you. And you know, and you do, you start to feel stressed out. I know people graduated in 2015 who are like, I'm done, you know, because they're doing all of this stuff. So one thing that I've learned, and school does not teach you how to be an artist. You learn how to paint, if you're fortunate. You learn skills and techniques, but no one teaches you what happens when you graduate. How do you network? How do you meet galleries? How do you do these things? How do you negotiate a contract? Do they give you a contract? What do you do when the galleries write you a check and it bounces and you would buy a piece of pizza and your car doesn't work? That happened to me. <laughs> I sold some work that got came in and I'm like, I'm buying some pizza. And they're like, the car just fine. I was like, what? And what do you do and who do you tell because they have so much power, at least we give them power, you know? So I recently um, was in New York for a weekend for a friend's show, and um, something in my spirit just said, you know what, I'm just going to go and just meet people. I made an announcement, I just went to my friend's show and had the time, and you start realizing, and I'm sure this has happened to you, and Alex and Laura and everybody else who's an artist in the room, that it's out when you're doing things and you're meeting people, right? And you're, you're present. Uh, I know that's how I've got to show, just by being on someone's radar. So I'm in New York at my friend's opening. We go to dinner afterwards, and it's really crowded. And I'm sitting at this long booth with these little bistro tables, and I'm talking to friends, and no one's sitting next to me, and other tables filled up. So I'm like, yeah, I don't know what's sitting next to me there. So all of a sudden, this woman comes over, and she sits down, and I smile, and she smiles, and I introduce myself. She introduces herself, and I said, oh, are you from New York? She's like, no, I'm from LA. I'm like, I'm from LA. She says, I'm an artist. I'm like, I'm an artist. And she said, her name is Mary. And I'm like, what's your last name? She's like, Weatherford. I'm like, oh, you know Mary oh, Weatherford. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mary Weatherford. <laughs> and I'm like, girl, I got to give you a hug. I give her a hug. And we start talking about art and being women artists and negotiating. And I was like, wow, I had to go all the way to New York to meet her for her to say, you know what I'm saying? It's just like, you, you just realize also that a lot in the art world seems like it's random. And it doesn't make sense, and a lot of stuff happens because you know people, but then you also, I feel, have to have the work. So when the opportunities arise that it's strong and powerful and relevant, you know? And the LA art world is very small. Mm -hmm. I mean, and the global art world is small at this point, but the LA art world is very small. Mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, uh, was there a reason um, you omitted all of the photos that you have in the 80s? Time. <laughs> um, I have time to be And also, work from that period of time I've got documentation of. The documentation is slides, so I need to digitize the slides. So I'm currently trying to digitize my archive just to catch up. So that's the big reason. Mostly, mostly I, though I've got documentation, I don't have modern documentation. If, no, not, I was going to say, if someone were to ask you, but I was like, I'm going to ask you, why do you make art like in a very brief way? Like, what is, if you can say one thing, <laughs> why do I make art? Yeah. Because I, honestly, there's nothing else I can do. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, I honestly, so I've been making art since I was a little kid, and this is the truth. I have vivid memories of being in elementary school in aftercare. I used to go to a place called Wilton Place Children's Center. And I would be indoors, I would see the cardboard boxes, and I would say, can I make a dollhouse? And I would be indoors while everyone was playing, and I was making a dollhouse out of cardboard. Cutting it, gluing it, bringing little people from home. Um, we lost it, but I won my first art award when I was like five, and it was the most horrible thing. It was just a circle of rectangle and stick legs, you know? And I was like, you know, my art career. Um, when I think about my life, all I do is envision me making, you know? Um, I, if I'm looking for that, I have no idea what to look for. 
right? It's just that these things happen to me. And um, it's just as part of my body as breathing. That's honestly the only way I can describe it. I love making and, and getting out what I need to get out. I think that's good. I think that true artists can't separate their art from their life. And, you know, I mean, I, I think that cooking, I, you know, I mean, I'm not going to sell something that I cook, but I think I put the same amount of energy into that that I put into making photographs or making films. And I get the same degree of pleasure out of it when somebody enjoys it or responds to it. So I really don't think that, you know, as, as somebody that considers himself an artist, I, I, I think that everything that I do is in some way, shape, or form an expression of who I am. So you can't separate, you can't separate the art from the artist. Yeah, my daughter would tell you that we, I was making so much and she, I was always making her make that there were so many supplies and things around the house that she didn't know if things were trash or art materials. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I felt so bad for my daughter about that she would just like bring trash like, but these are art supplies. <laughs>
And if it doesn't happen until my X amount of years, okay, I mean, I may because I have to. But I would love for that to happen. That is my fantasy and dream, and I believe most artists uh, want that for themselves as well. Thank you. Can I ask about the, the what you're showing is what you're working on? And I was talking to someone, I can hear her, and I wanted to pretend like I wasn't the artist. 